Uh, hi everyone, I'm Arjun Neja, and welcome to another episode of With Vichar. And today we have a very interesting guest with us. It's Mr. Tanmay Goswami. So, how are you doing, Mr. Goswami? I'm good. I'm good. And please call me Tanmay. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. And thanks for having me, Arjun. Yeah. So Tanmay is has been an editor, a business journalist for many years. He's been an editor at Fortune Magazine India. and he's been the editor at uh, ET Prime which is a subscription based service by Economic Times and uh, that is where i met uh, tanmay as well i interned under him uh, last year but uh, since then you've taken a very interesting turn from a business journalist to being the sanity uh, sanity correspondent for the correspondent which is i, I think another subscription based website so can you explain this change and how how did this happen how did you go from being a business journalist to being a mental health correspondent yeah sure this is a story i can uh, i think i can talk about all day but essentially um this happened i think out of many years of my own journey uh, uh, you know trying to figure out my own depression and anxiety which i have had for at least two decades of my life maybe uh, even before that i had some um, uh, symptoms of it but the diagnosis formally happened about 17 18 years ago when i was in college um and so through those two decades um, one has been looking for answers in all sorts of things western medicine alternative healing um and ultimately what i discovered was that the only thing that gives me sort of lasting relief um is being able to communicate um uh, about my condition um transparently with the rest of the world and uh, the uh validation that one receives when one talks about it is quite phenomenal actually um contrary to what a lot of people have experienced which is um you know stigma and these these are not things that you talk about openly um in most societies not just in india um my own experience i have been extremely fortunate to to have found um a community out there that has been very receptive very open um and that has helped me heal so i started writing about um you know my experiences on linkedin a couple of posts i did about uh 3 3 and a half years ago went viral um after that i started maintaining a twitter thread it's sort of like a diary of my depression and anxiety um and that also became um quite popular and thereafter i started realizing that you know this is something that i want to do full time talking about mental health is not something i wanted to do for a couple of hours a day i wanted to do it all the time um and i was uh, when i was working with uh, et et prime um i was the associate editor and at that time i think um, the linear ambition that most journalists have is to become the editor someday and uh, lead the big team uh, but i realized that that's not something that interested me and i wanted to i think i got to work with very um interesting smart young people like yourself and um all of those um experiences the more i spoke with people the more convinced i became um that the real uh, area where i can probably uh, contribute um as a journalist is not business journalism but in mental health which is a um to my my i don't know of too many people in the world who do this full time um and so when the correspondent was launching they are backed by an enormously successful dutch platform called do correspondent and they've been around for 7 years um so when they decided to launch their english platform i kind of took a moon shot and i applied and they were hiring only five correspondents from around the world and i was tremendously lucky that i was one of them and so that's the transition i now do this full time i have um a, a terrific team um, we have readers in 140 plus countries and um apart from writing for the correspondent i do a lot of advocacy for uh, suicide prevention that's something that i'm extremely involved with now um especially in the context of covid there is a spike in suicides um so um my days in business journalism now seem very very uh, almost like a different lifetime so Mm-hmm. that's how the transition has happened yeah and it, and it's uh, and it's crazy to think that all of this happened in the span of one year yes yes it is um yeah it doesn't it 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 feels quite surreal it, it's um 
it's a complete shift for me in terms of uh, my approach to journalism um you know one of the one of the things that you're taught as a journalist um is to be uh, objective and is to sort of maintain that that veneer of neutrality and at the correspondent we have absolutely you know we, we rubbish those ideas we don't believe in uh, objectivity we don't believe in neutrality we believe that um, the journalists first person uh, experiences have to be the anchor for every story especially in a beat like mental health which is all about lived experience um so yeah it's quite quite uh, surreal to imagine that even a year ago i was in a completely different environment and i'm very grateful to have um done all those gigs for 15 years of my life i think everything has prepared me to be where i am today so uh, naturally uh, you you so heavily involved in the mental health space and the covid-19 crisis has brought about its own set of challenges to this so what's what's your take on this like how do you think it has affected the mental health space yeah so you know there's a lot of commentary out there you will uh, you know the typical media narrative around mental health during covid-19 is it's the next big crisis that is about to erupt um you know it's it's going to explode on our faces and i have a big problem with that because it's not as if mental uh, ill health or mental illness um that this problem is not new this has been around for decades in centuries and it's only because now the proverbial shit has hit the roof that we are all scurrying and we are all we have suddenly become cognizant that this is a problem because uh you know the the, the challenge for mental health activists has always been denial society has always lived in denial about this about the existence of this uh, particular problem and now there is no room for denial which is why um, you know you are you are you are seeing people increasingly talk about it so that's the first myth or illusion that one needs to dismantle is that mental health uh, is not the next big thing it's always been around and it's just that our attention has now coalesced around it because of uh this pandemic uh which is which is literally which is hitting everybody every home every family um nobody is immune um so uh, i think the uh, the the other uh, challenge with with mental health uh in the way in which in the public discourse or in in popular imagination the way in which we think of mental health is that we think of it as a healthcare issue um just like you know diabetes or i mean these are very these are very common uh analogies that are often drawn and these are well meaning analogies by the way when people will say why don't you talk about your depression the same way you talk about diabetes or about a broken broken limb um and the idea in that analogy is very much to destigmatize mental illness and get people to talk more openly which is it's very well meaning but you realize um once you've been in this space for a while you realize that those analogies are also quite uh problematic because mental health is is such an intersectional issue it's it's not like diabetes in in the sense that um in 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 diabetes you have uh, you know one particular two particular things in your biochemistry that go wrong um leading to uh, diabetes but with depression or with anxiety or with bipolar disorder or with schizophrenia or with any of the you know on the vast spectrum of mental health all the disorders or or all the conditions um nobody knows there we we can only take some um half educated guesses as to why these things happen um but there are no definitive answers um and the only thing that we know for sure is that mental health sits at the intersection of politics economics identity uh you know all of these various things so what covid-19 uh, has done is it has exposed how frail some of these superstructures are so for instance with all the, the the global economy coming to a standstill and people losing jobs and you know hunger and you know we you know what's happening with with the migrant workers in india um you know the the tremendous stress that even bureaucrats and police people are operating under um all of that you know contributes to um a disorder in somebody's mental health so um we cannot you know for instance one of the things that we are very worried about um and when i say we i mean the sort of you know the mental health community in india 
uh, we are very worried about is once the pandemic lifts and once the lockdown lifts and the full toll of the economic crisis becomes apparent um, and, 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 you know, uh, it, it's already quite spectacularly horrifying, you know, what's going on around us. Um, but one, the, once the full toll becomes apparent, um, you know, what happens to the number of suicides? What happens to people? Uh, what happens to families that, are sudden, that have suddenly been rendered, um, you know, uh, without an income? So um, approaching mental health in the context of COVID um, requires a very, very, at the policy level, requires a very intersectional, uh, holistic, intersectoral approach. You cannot resolve the mental health crisis uh, created by COVID or exacerbated by COVID without providing jobs, without providing universal income, without taking care of all the thousands of kids who are waiting anxiously for their uh, academic sessions to resume, um, you know, or for exams to happen. Um, so that's, the, that's, that's been our appeal to all stakeholders that please don't look at mental health in isolation in a silo and brush it off as a health sector issue. It is not a health sector issue. And if there is one thing that one lesson that COVID has, has taught us, it is that each one of us is as safe as the most vulnerable amongst us. And, you know, so if we have to reimagine society, if we have to reimagine the world after this pandemic, um, we've got to think of it bottom up. We, can, we, we, we no longer can rely on the stop down structures of governance of policy uh, that have permeated almost every area of human existence. Um, so those are, I think, some of my initial, I, I would say, you know, macro level thoughts. So yeah, for sure, like it has in a lot of ways exasperated what has already been piling on, especially by, in a lot of ways, one of the problems with the Indian state per se uh, is that mental health isn't really seen as a huge problem. And now, uh, and a lot of it is considered only to be seen by, say, a rich person's problem. But uh, especially, I think one of your writings has been about, oh, what the migrant workers are uh, going through or how it affects uh, as simple as a social dis distancing even possible in a country like India. So I think these kind of issues are what uh, we have to essentially think about now. So, which brings me to a very interesting article you wrote about the psychology of space and of how it's the newest debate that people have to have in India due to the crisis. So what do you mean by when you say psychology of space and how does that separate India from, say, the Western countries? Yeah, thanks for asking the question. Yeah, so um, what happened was about, about um, I think, about 25, 25, 20, 25 days ago, I got a, a DM on Twitter from a young man from Gujarat uh, who said that he had seen some tweet of mine on Al Jazeera, uh, the television channel. And I was quite surprised. I, I had no idea what he was talking about. And then he said, okay, this was the tweet. And the tweet was essentially um, uh, something to do with, uh, you know, I think it, it was something to do with the uh, social dimension of, of, of COVID. I don't remember the exact tweet. But then we got talking. And then he said, you know, um, uh, I, I'm really struggling. And I said, what's up? And he said, you know, I live in this house with my entire family and we cooked up together under the same roof and it's just become extremely difficult for me to survive with my family and I keep having these, having these fights with my brother and it's just um, very difficult and what do I do? Can, can you give me some tips? Um, and that kind of got me thinking. Uh, I was already thinking about the space problem when, when uh, on, on uh, 24th of March when we, when we went into lockdown. Um, I think the assumption that was made, and, and again, this is not a, uh, to be fair, this is not a criticism of any government because, um, you know, these are when such a broad level decision is made, um, you know, a lot of criticism happened about, uh, to, uh, you know, that there wasn't enough time given, for instance, and those are all valid criticisms. But the, 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 reality, the, the reality of India is that most Indians, even those who have homes, uh, and there are about 1.7 million Indians, I think, who don't have homes or homeless. But those who even even those who have homes, the per capita space availability is less than what is recommended for a, for a prison cell. 
and these are uh, you know uh, some data points that I quoted in my uh, in my article. Um, but when this gentleman called me, I, I mean DM me and spoke with me, I realized that this is not a poor person's problem. It's not. It's the moment we think about space crunch, we think of Dharavi, for instance. Yeah. You know, but that is not that is not necessarily uh, you know uh, uh, correct. Uh, this this boy was talking to me from Surat. He was evidently from, um, a, you know, uh, definitely not from a poor family, um, because he was exchanging Twitter messages with me, um, and yet he was worried about space, um, and that got me thinking that you know this the the uh, idea of space that we have in India is so fractured and it is so broken uh, because we are such a community oriented country. We are such a collectivist country, unlike some countries in the West, which are very much, you know, very individualistic in their uh, social, uh, you know, the fa social fabric is extremely uh, individual oriented. In India, it is extremely community and collective oriented. Um, and as a result of that, ever since, um, uh, I think I remembered my own, uh, you know, uh, upbringing in eighties and in the eighties and nineties, and I remember being constantly chided and rebuked for demanding space. If I ever asked for space, both physical space and emotional space, it was something that was considered taboo almost, uh, because it militates against the norm of a good Indian uh, model Indian behavior. Uh, you're supposed to be sociable. You're supposed to rub shoulders with others. You're supposed to have um, you know, a fluid spaces where people can walk in and walk out without even uh, a knocking on the door sometimes. Um, and now we are suddenly confronted by a situation where maintaining space almost becomes a patriotic duty. It becomes your highest civic responsibility. Uh, but the sheer physical reality of it, which is that we just don't have enough space going around for uh, 1.3 billion of us. And the psychological reality, which is that space has often been painted as a guilty pleasure, you know. Um, those two things come together to create a very, very difficult uh, cocktail of emotions for many, many, for many people. Um, suddenly they have to, they are being told that, you know, uh, this one, one and a half meters or whatever, two meters of distance between us is uh, a civic duty, almost a patriotic duty. But at the same time, they have grown up uh, they've been conditioned to think that space is not what, you know, the, the model Indian should aspire for. In fact, in our public spaces, as you know, the most common refrain is kindly adjust because, you know, we are so used to fitting in two where one can barely squeeze in, you yes. know. Um, so, so that article was essentially, and this is not just an Indian phenomenon, of course, all many societies in the global south um, uh, face this challenge. My colleague from Nigeria, Olupi Mehin, she wrote an article on what's happening in Lagos, um, where virtually their entire lives are played out on the streets. You know, there's hardly any activity, any human activity imaginable that doesn't happen on the streets in Lagos. And suddenly they're being asked to withdraw from the public space. And that's just very unnatural. Uh, and that's exactly what we see in India when when the prime minister, for instance, asked people to stand on the balconies and clap or clang utensils or whatever, we had an outpouring of people on the streets as if they were celebrating some carnival. And uh, that was very poorly thought through on the government's part, right? Because what I think the government forgot was we are such crowd-oriented people. We love, we thrive in crowds. And so it kind of became an excuse for us to go out there and assert that collective the collectivist identity. So those are some of the fault lines I think that I tried to explore. Please. Yes. So which uh, this kind of conversation actually brings to me uh, a problem I think that you might be facing yourself as a journalist of mental health in India, which is how exactly do you think, are you, what kind of resources are we able to provide to be people who are not as lucky as us. So the gentleman in Surat was uh, knows English, is able to use Twitter. So he has all of those circumstances which led him to easily communicate with you, a mental health journalist. And first of all, like that's a limited resource in and of itself. But for someone who can't speak English, for someone who doesn't really know how to use the internet, uh, if anything, maybe they could have gone to a hospital before a government hospital. I'm not sure how effective those are in the first place for mental health issues. But 
now the probably they can't even go to a hospital for such crisis and they don't even know whether it's a problem in the first place so how exactly do you go through this problem solve this problem essentially yeah yeah this is again a, a very very uh, i think important important question um look to set the record straight mental health has always languished um at the very bottom of uh, the indian state's priorities uh, we've had a national mental health mission we've had all sorts of things but uh, if you look at the budgetary allocation for instance for mental health has been shrinking year on year um the condition of um, uh, resource availability at the grassroots is quite abysmal and and i mean some a simple google search will tell you how many psychiatrists for instance india has or how many mental health nurses india has so i'm not going into those numbers they're pretty abysmal but i think talking only about that you know kind of obscures the larger picture because then we get fixated with um you know a sort of piecemeal solution to it which is to produce more doctors and more nurses um and and somehow reach more medicines in the hand of in the hands of people which obscures the larger issue because as i as i talked about earlier um mental health is not just a healthcare healthcare issue um so uh, in terms of uh, you know resource availability um if we have to scale up our existing resources to meet the demands that currently exist in this country and i mean you know you you have to look at the national mental health survey 2016 which was conducted by nimhans um and you will realize that it's virtually impossible for us and it, it it will take us a couple of decades if not more to produce enough and that is assuming that the demand does not go up in that time uh the demand will also go up with greater awareness that's one of the downsides or one of the risks that come with greater awareness because once people are aware then they start demanding services you know you can't just make somebody aware and then not support them with services right so right now what's happening is there is a lot of talk there is even in the uh, local language press in the hindi press in the bengali press there is a lot of talk about mental health and it's become fashionable so the awareness is percolating uh, to the to the uh, across social strata but we are not able to support all that awareness with services um so what is the alternative what is the uh, way to deal with this um one way to deal with this um is a uh, you know a, a model that is being practiced by uh, this in this project called atmiyata atmiyata is a project that runs in the mehsana district of gujarat um and what they do is they have these they have what they call mental health champions uh that are identified from within each village so these are villagers essentially some of them are school drop drop out some of them could be barely literate some of them are you know graduates um some of them used to do odd jobs earlier you know um uh, maybe somebody is a farmer part time farmer these are all many of them are young people they're from different castes they're from different religions and um, you know and there are very stratified caste lines in in these areas um but these mental health champions because they are from those villages uh, people are uh, intuitively more responsive to them so these people are identified trained on the basics of mental health uh, identifying common stressors uh, signs of distress um, and then basic counseling and then uh, if the situation is very severe then they gently nudge these people to go to the nearest district health center or primary health center uh and and avail uh, you know uh, clinical services um so this is the, the community led model of 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 mental health intervention uh to my mind there is no alternative to this if we depend only on the conventional on the formal health system we will never be able to uh you know uh, fulfill all the demand so the solution is empowering communities at the grassroots empowering communities in villages empowering our own families and friends and If each one of us uh starts approaching mental health as our own problem and not somebody else's problem uh and you know we are all trained in the basics i'm not saying that is a replacement for uh for specialists but a lot of the distress or malady or um you know a cry for help uh in the early stages of mental distress um if if we pay attention to it at that stage and we don't allow it to become a festering sore and we don't allow it to become a full blown crisis um so this preventive approach rather than a curative approach you know um 
and and I think we are we have been besotted with this you know curing depression and curing anxiety and while of course that that approach has its space but we will never be able to you know catch up if we are obsessed with curing people we have to prevent these things from becoming problems to begin with and the community based model I urge uh, whoever is listening to this or watching this to look up Atmiyata they are doing some stellar work um, another project for instance uh, called spirit which is a suicide prevention project and suicides are not always the result of mental illness that's another big myth that suicides um, are always the result of you know some chemical imbalance in your brain that's not true at all um, many suicides are impulsive many suicides are because of socioeconomic triggers uh, for instance farmer suicides they are they're the result of debt deprivation uh, not because uh, a farmer uh, you know has a clinical depressive condition uh, necessarily. So um, what the Spirit Project has done uh, is they have they have installed these lockers in villages where they store away the pesticides so that farmers don't have access to pesticides because they figured that one of the uh, most common ways in which farmers kill themselves is by in, imbibing pesticides. So they, they, they build these lockers and they store away the pesticides in those lockers. In Sri Lanka, this is found to be quite effective, although it's an evolving field of study, so it's difficult to make you know, positive claims, but um, this approach has been found quite useful in, in Sri Lanka. So again, the, focusing on the community, focusing on approaches that are not within the, within the ambit of conventional healthcare systems. And I think the less we rely on the government, you know, um, the better because the government will do what it has to but it will work in a, a glacial pace and mental health is not a priority for any government it has not been a priority um, and so it's up to us really it's up to communities and civil society to really empower ourselves train ourselves help each other that's to my mind that really is the future i think i think it's quite reassuring that even though at an extremely small scale but it's a grassroots campaign at the end of the day that's essentially helping us build a community of sorts. And there are people who care about mental health, even for the poor, I guess, which is not really, especially yes. if you look at the number of suicides in India, farmer suicides constitute a large share of that. So we, it's, it's, an, it's a fact that one has to address before really moving on to large uh, other issues. Uh, I think uh, on a slightly uh, lighter note, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about uh, your how exactly you're coping up with work. So uh, unlike I'd imagine because of the correspondent, you've been working for from home for the last uh, few months, right? So you've so yeah. you started with the working from home experiment a few months before any, everyone else did because of COVID-19. So uh, everyone else, like I'm sure like most, most of your uh, other work colleagues are now working from home. Obviously students like us, we, we still have university going on. A few of us also have exams. Fortunately, exams have been canceled for first year. So I've been lucky in that sense. But uh, a, few, for a few second and third years also have exams and just coping with that understanding how different systems are going and even at home having a schedule in the first place just understanding oh just because you're at home doesn't mean you can watch netflix all day so how exactly have you been coping with the same and uh, do you have any tips for students like us yeah uh, I, I i have been fortunate because I've, i was used to the rhythms of work from home um, uh, for a little bit longer than many other people i think um, my days are not my my days are not materially different. Uh, they are they are the same as they were six months ago. So um, I, I I'm afraid I'm not really I, I won't really be able to give you very wise insights about how to make the transition happen. For me, I I generally uh, work in a in a space that is uh, again I'm tremendously privileged. I have my own space. Uh, I have a I have a small uh, a baby at home and. Um, you know, uh, it gives me a lot of pleasure to be able to be available, you know, whenever um, he needs me, um, even if I, even if he just calls out for me and I can just shout out, you know, and, and respond to him. Um, and I think the, the important thing is out of this, uh, from this transition that has happened is, uh, I, I feel when people go back to work, when they eventually go back to work, um, something very profound would have changed in, in the way they um, in the way they present themselves 
in the workplace because i think people have the the boundaries between work and home have blurred to the extent that now people will not be defensive anymore about you know going back to work and being who they are you know like my my dream is that people will go back to work and uh demand that their employers look at them as messy complex individuals who have messy complex lives and you know not be apologetic about having a bad day or about you know crying in the office or about just you know having a meltdown or uh just not being in a good mood and you know the the hardest thing to do in in uh, in the corporate uh, environment is to sort of put on a mask and pretend as if the moment you step into the office you're magically another person and uh, you know you you leave all your personal problems behind and you're supposed to be a professional and you know not bring up awkward or inconvenient inconvenient or unproductive um ideas and topics to the workplace and i think it's 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 time now to consign that to the dustbin i think um and i feel this transition may have strengthened some of us our, our resolve to go back to the workplace whenever we do and demand that we be treated as you know um uh, as 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 people not as robots um in terms of you know tips for students uh, gosh i'm again very very poorly qualified but you know i actually when you told me yesterday that this is something you would like me to talk about i actually spoke with a therapist about this and i said if you were to answer this question what would you say and so they sent me like very detailed notes i'll send you those notes later but i'll tell you some things that that they talked about so i'm i'm quoting um, the therapist things are uncertain so they will have re- so they will have reactions they meaning students and that's all right uh, be in touch with what one is feeling being stressed as you don't know when exams will happen uh, and what the future holds all of these are valid feelings these are valid questions and not knowing the answers can be very scary can be disturbing frustrating it can make you angry and i think it's important first of all to acknowledge all of those emotions and say you know tell yourself this is completely normal this is completely all right um second is just of course to talk to somebody and i think this is where students have a great advantage over other demographics because there are you have access to most students most uh students have access to groups of friends or whatever so at least even if you have one friend you know talk about how you feel um the other thing which is very 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 important i think is to just focus on what you can control right now and there are just there are way too many things that we can't control just focus on what you can control uh look at the bigger picture uh, and i think just having the belief that you know injustice won't be done that you know this is something that is affecting um 8 billion people on this planet and so you won't be singled out for uh you know um uh, discrimination or injustice in any form so the system will be sympathetic and they will have to there's no option um you know the, the other uh, uh standard advice that that is uh, shared a lot is you know maybe you can indulge in some kind of d- developing some new skill sets you know but i i personally don't believe in that i feel that uh you should you should look at this for what it is it is a global pandemic where people are losing their lives it's very scary this is not we we have not gone into lockdown voluntarily this is not an act of choice and therefore forget about building new skills or being productive all the time and you know fixating on oh my god like this is becoming sort of like an instagram phenomenon everyone is posting pictures of what they cooked today and you know uh, oh look at me i've learned to play the guitar that's okay i mean it works whoever it works for it's all right but i don't think this should become a competition to develop new skills because for god's sake like this is a global emergency this is not <laughs> fun and games you know so and this obsession with productivity is what is at the root of a lot of mental distress to begin with uh, you know in young people as well as older people and the least that we can do for ourselves right now is to sit back and just look at this situation for what it is which is a scary frightening once in a lifetime kind of experience um, and productivity and skill building and all of that can wait if you can bring yourself to do it please by all means it's a great outlet but allow yourself some time to just switch off and collapse it's all right you know and 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 forgive yourself that uh, uh impulse it, it, it it's completely all right so i would say 
yeah, those are, I, I can't imagine. I, 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 I'm sure it's incredibly difficult being a student right now. It's not easy to not know what the future holds and it's scary. Um, so all my good wishes. Uh, oh, thank you. I'm sure those words mean a lot to everyone who's watching. And uh, even for me, for example, like oh, coping with suddenly coming back home at uh, no, not really knowing when I'll be going back to the university and like, oh, leaving all my friends behind, like all of the, all of that, even though, again, I've been lucky to not have exams, has been hectic for me as well. So I'm sure these words are quite important to anyone who's listening. And uh, I think that's uh, at that sombering note, like that's a very good point to end. Uh, I'm sure we can, uh, anyone who is more interested in your work can find you at The Correspondent and also at Twitter at Toy Mango, which is, again, a really, really interesting username. <laughs> uh, thank Thanks. you so much for, for coming. Thank you, Aryan. Take care and good luck to all of you. Yeah, you too.